So it's my honor indeed and my privilege for the third time to welcome Professor Avi Leib uh, from Harvard University on the show. And the, this is something that we've done two times before already. First time we had a little chit chat, so to say, a little more than that actually, about the Oumuamua and also connected to your first book that came out uh, during the COVID times. Uh, at least in the Hungarian version came out back then. And then last year, we also had another discussion that mainly focused on your idea of storing some kind of uh, safety backup of, of all human knowledge on the moon, which is also very interesting, of course, and very uh, inspiring to all our listeners. But then at the end of, of, of that second to you, you mentioned that you were about to to, to go to this uh, incredible uh, expedition to the Pacific to find something that you knew probably lays there underneath the water. Uh, and, and of course, since then, this expedition happened. And then you said that after the expedition, we should talk. And so this time has finally come. And so please, just for, from the very beginning, please tell our listeners who may not be that familiar with the entire story like myself. So please tell them what, what is interstellar meteorite number one and how you know about it and how did you know where to go and what did you actually find on this expedition? Well, uh, first, uh, thank you so much for hosting me again. It's a great pleasure to join you. Um, and if I had to summarize in one word uh, the outcome of this uh, expedition, it's the title of my new book, uh, Interstellar. Oh, That's the yeah. summary. And I this see. book just came out, uh, but let me start from the beginning. Um, in uh, January 8th, 2014, almost a decade ago, uh, U.S. government satellites um, detected a fireball from the collision of an object roughly half a meter in size with Earth. And that happens routinely, but what was special about this object was that it was moving very fast. In fact, we calculated that outside the solar system, it was moving at 60 kilometers per second. It was not bound to the sun. And uh, even outside the solar system, it was moving faster than 95% of all stars relative to the local frame of the Milky Way galaxy. And um, uh, we wrote a, a paper saying that this uh, object is interstellar. It's actually the first one to be recognized because uh, Oumuamua was discovered uh, almost four years later. Um, and um, moreover, um, the U.S. government released uh, data about its fireball that allowed us to conclude that it was tougher in material strength than all space rocks in the NASA catalog of the past decade, 272 of them. So it was an outlier, both in terms of speed and in terms of material strength. And and so, me, sorry, how, how could they possibly deduce the, the material strength? We, the, um, so they provided the elevation at which it disintegrated. Uh -huh. ah. And given its high speed, we could calculate how much stress was exerted on the surface of the object before it exploded. And it was higher than all other meteors in the catalog. They always disintegrated at much higher elevations where the density of air is much smaller and they were moving not as fast as this object. So we concluded that it's even tougher than iron meteorites. And mm -hmm. uh, then uh, that raised the possibility that is quite intriguing, that it may have been a Voyager-like meteor, because if you imagine the spacecraft that we sent out of the solar system, uh, eventually colliding with a planet like the Earth, it would appear as a meteor of unusual material strength and unusual speed. And uh, uh, as a result, um, after the government uh, confirmed that this object is interstellar, there was a letter from the U.S. Space Command that was sent to NASA uh, testifying that the 99.999 percent this object is indeed from outside the solar system. I decided to lead an expedition uh, that went to the meteor site. And the government coordinates were accurate to within uh, about 10 kilometers. So we had a search region that is 10 kilometers in size. We were able to narrow it down to the likely meteor path, 
by measuring uh, the delay time for the sound that arrived at the seismometer on Manus Island in Papua New Guinea uh, relative to the light. And just like uh, you hear a thunder after there is a lightning with some delay, that tells you how far away it is. So we were able to narrow down the search area from there. But um, then uh, uh, I uh, assembled a team of uh, uh, 28 uh, individuals and uh, um, and I uh, we estimated that it would cost one and a half million dollars. And gladly, after I announced about the expedition, within a few months, I had a Zoom call with a funder, uh, Charles Hoskinson, who said, you have the money. And then we started designing the machinery that we used. And it was a sled with magnets on both sides. And we connected it with a cable to the ship. The cable was five kilometers long and the depth of the ocean was two kilometers at that location. So well, the, the idea was to drag the sled on the ocean floor so that it, it would collect magnetic particles left over from this meteor. And uh, we calculated that they should have a size of one millimeter or less. These are molten droplets from the surface of the object when it was exposed to the immense heat from the fireball as a result of its friction with air. And uh, there were a few percent of the Hiroshima atomic bomb energy released in that explosion. So we went to look for millimeter sized particles, the size of a grain of sand across a region that is 10 kilometers in size at an ocean depth of two kilometers. It sounds impossible, but uh, uh, indeed in the first uh, day, we couldn't keep the sled on the ocean floor because the cable was lifting it up. It was kiting. But then we realized, the engineers on the team realized that uh, if we go with the ocean currents, we can keep it on the floor. And we started collecting materials, most of which was uh, volcanic ash and uh, black powder. And after six days, uh, we started filtering out uh, the black powder. Uh, at that point, uh, I mean, I wrote uh, 43 diary reports during the expedition. And uh, on that day, I said, where are the spherules? These are the molten droplets from the surface of the object. Uh, and then a day later, we took the bigger particles, put them under a microscope and found the first molten droplet, which looked very different from the background sand because it looked like a marble, metallic marble. And I basically hugged the person who found it uh, and said, that's what we were looking for, because I knew that if we find one, just like if you find an ant in the kitchen, there would be many more out there. And indeed, we found altogether 50 of them on the ship. And then uh, I shipped the uh, materials back and uh, a summer intern of mine, uh, Sophie Bergstrom, found uh, another 600. And altogether by now we have 700 or so molten droplets. And uh, when I came back to Harvard, I asked my postdoc, uh, Laura Dumin, to make a a map of the spherules that we found, and uh, we found an excess along the meteor path. And uh, also we found a special, when we analyzed the composition of the spherules, uh, we found in the laboratory of Stein Jacobson, a, a geochemist, my colleague at Harvard, we found a composition of spherules along the meteor path in the high yield regions that uh, was never seen before. It's uh, different from solar system materials. It has a high abundance of beryllium, lanthanum, uranium, and we called it Belau composition because never before it was given a name. Uh, so um, it was only found along the meteor path, not in control regions that we, I mean, we visited regions far away from the meteor path and didn't find it. And so uh, we are very excited about this. We wrote a scientific paper that details the results. Uh, but the basic point is the velocity measurement of the US government indicated that this meteor is from outside the solar system. Then we went there, we found an excess of spherules, molten droplets from the object along the path of the meteor. And when we analyzed the composition, we found that uh, in those locations, the, the composition was never seen before. It's from extrasolar uh, source that is beyond the solar system. And we have some ideas of where, uh, what could have produced this unusual composition. Hmm. 
OK, well, before I'm asking what, because of course I will certainly ask what, what these processes might be, but to, just let me understand this very clearly that basically what happens is that you have this estimate of the impact site, so to say, where it hit the, 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 the ocean <clears throat> based on this uh, seismometric and from the satellite the disintegration. Uh, it was a stamp. strip, was by the way. It was yeah. not one point, it was a path mm. because ah, okay. it came yeah. at, along a path and then you know, the explosion took uh, place in three flares that were separated by a tenth of a second, so uh, right. a few kilometers from each other. So altogether, it went on a line uh, that was defined over there. So, so my question, which comes up now, is that, that I happen to know a, a happens to be a jazz guitarist, by the way, from Norway called Jon Larsen, who is collecting micro meteorites from everywhere, so from the rooftops. And right. and he says that he was always where he always heard that that I don't know I I forgot the data already but I think like ten tons of cosmic material is falling to the earth every day right. and he was just cu curious where it is he actually went up in Oslo to the top of the house and, and managed to find little pieces of course metallic right. meteorites are easier yeah. to find it's everywhere. So he, it's everywhere it's everywhere right. right and so so this is a question that that obviously. Uh, pro I assume that you also uh, you kind of crossed this track, right? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. No, so, so let me explain. So we yeah. went also to regions that are far away from the meteor path, and we yeah, we, that's we, what we found the we found spherules everywhere. So uh -huh. the ones that are special composition are a minority. They're about ten percent of the total. Okay. So, um, okay. so we expect out of the 700 to have maybe 70 or so uh, that are of this special composition and the rest are background. So even along the meteor path, uh, there are some background and we could identify them as being, uh, you know, the typical composition of solar system rocks. And we did identify, in fact, most of them to be of that nature, but then we found spherules that are a minority that are only concentrated along the meteor path and are a very unusual composition. You don't find them uh, in rocks on Earth, the Moon, Mars, or asteroids. So the whole point is, indeed, there is everywhere you find those spherules, uh, but something as unusual as we found, and just to explain, what is unusual is that the abundance of elements like beryllium, lanthanum, and uranium is hundreds of times up to a thousand times more than in the standard solar composition that the solar system started from. It's, we are, I'm not talking about a factor of a, a few, 10, or even 100. I'm talking about up to a thousand. So uranium in some of those is getting close to a thousand times more than you find in the standard solar system abundance. And um, that makes it very unusual. Okay, and you mentioned that you may have some ideas for the reason of, for this uh, unique composition. So what, right. please, please tell me about those. <laughs> so one uh, possibility is to imagine a planet which is a magma ocean. Basically, the rock is molten on the surface. The Earth started this way because it was bombarded by very heavy objects, and one of them created the moon. So the moon also started as a magma ocean, and the same was true for Mars. But the composition that we find right now on these objects does not match what we have. But you can still get an enhancement in the elements that we saw, like lanthanum, uranium, and even beryllium, as a result of what's called differentiation. When, when a planet has an iron core, some element, and it's molten, some elements are sinking towards the iron core because they have affinity, chemical affinity to iron. So they get attracted to iron, they segregate in the core, and they leave behind in the crust of the planet the elements that we find to be overpopulated. So, so indeed, if you start as a magma ocean, you can end up with a crust that is a composition uh, similar to what we have, except that it's not the same for Earth, the Moon, or Mars. And that's why we argue for an object, a planet, perhaps, uh, that was a magma ocean, but near a different star where the conditions were different than in the solar system. So that is the natural origin. There is also the possibility of an artificial origin because uh, someone, an astronomer approached me and said, well, you know that lanthanum and molybdenum are substrates of semiconductors. 
And of course, uh, uranium is used as fuel for fission reactors. So you can imagine a technological reason for putting them together with a high abundance. And we don't know. So the best way to find out if it's a natural origin or a technological origin would be to find a big piece of the object. And that's what we plan to do in the next expedition. We are currently thinking about what machinery to use, what kind of tools. It will be more expensive, but we plan to do it in the coming year. Look for bigger pieces, because then you can tell easily the difference between a rock and a technological gadget. And the fundamental question would be, if we find a gadget that has buttons on it, I asked the students in my class, should we press a button? And half of the students said, uh, no, please don't do that because it will affect all of us. And half of the students said, uh, please do, uh, because we are very curious to see what would happen. And then one student asked me, what will I actually do? And I said, uh, I will bring it to a laboratory to examine it before engaging with it. Um, so, you know, we don't know if it's a natural or technological. And I'm actually currently trying to work out the numbers that a natural source would have to satisfy. And they're very challenging. You need them um, of the order of 10 to the power 23 uh, such rocks, each of them 500 kilograms per star, like the sun in the Milky Way galaxy to have a large enough population so that one of them will collide with Earth every decade. And that is a lot because if you take 10 to the power 23 times the mass of 500 kilograms, this is roughly the mass of the Earth. So for every star in the Milky Way galaxy, roughly speaking, you need an Earth mass planet to be broken into 10 to the power 23 pieces, uh, such that each of them is 500 kilograms. Uh, and that's not trivial, but I'm working on a possible scenario for that. It's kind of the number of atoms in a glass of water or something yeah, like that. Well, right? in, so, in a cubic centimeter, yes. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So, yeah. Incredible. Right, okay, but but uh, you, you have any kind of a upper limit for, 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 for how large can the largest piece of debris can possibly be? You mentioned that based on the calculations, if I got it correctly, then the that the size of this object when it hit the atmosphere was about half a meter or so. Yes, yes. And so, so that after was, uh, hitting... roughly roughly 500 kilograms. But I should say this is if the entire object disintegrated in the explosion. However, mm -hmm. you can imagine a bigger object such that just the surface of it would get evaporated and then the core would survive all the way down to the ocean floor. And that's why we will go to look for any bigger pieces. Yeah, okay, like a capsule, like what happened yesterday, for example, when Osiris <laughs> Rex capsule just landed in. Yeah, Europe. that's that's yes. in my uh, dream. <laughs> uh, I, you know, if it's a rock, we will just find a rock. Yeah, but you last time you mentioned that if it turns out to be an artificial object, you may just as well give it to the Modern Arts Museum of New York, right? You remember you said that. Yes, but, yes, I yeah. said that, and I will actually meet the. Uh, curator of that museum uh, in a couple of months and uh, I hope she doesn't remember because then I can keep it uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we shall see okay at least uh, we, we should uh, make sure that they will not push the button <laughs> all right okay yeah. so the, oh, just the, this expedition was relatively recent so I mean you came back like uh, I don't know it, it was the end of June uh, it, June the expedition was between the 14th right. and 28th of June. And now we are planning the next expedition to find the bigger pieces. And um, altogether, I should say there were many failure points uh, where the expedition could have failed. And for example, imagine that, uh, you know, there wouldn't be a funder. Nobody would give me the money. Uh, or even after we got the money that I wouldn't uh, attract the very best uh, professionals, engineers, navigators, coordinators of this expedition. And then getting the ship, you know, that we rented, uh, which is uh, which was ideal for our purposes. That is not always uh, possible. Uh, and then uh, uh, building the machinery that will work, you know, that was also not guaranteed. And then getting the materials, uh, you know, it's possible if the meteor was half its uh, size, let's say, 
several tens of centimeters, there wouldn't be enough spherules for us to collect with a one meter wide sled as we went back and forth 26 times across that region. So, and even after we collected the materials, we might have missed those spherules. And even if we were to collect the spherules, uh, my colleague at Harvard, Stein Jacobson, could have said, I have other priorities now for research. I cannot allocate my research team to your needs. And then we would never find those Belau spherules. So a lot of steps along the way, but uh, all of them worked successfully. And the bottom line is uh, that it's sometimes worth uh, taking a risk in scientific research uh, because you might, if you don't search, you will never find anything. That's for sure. And in life in general, it's good to be an optimist because sometimes life is a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> yeah, that's smart. Uh, just one question for the next expedition. Are you planning to also involve submarines, either remote controlled or, or crews? Or, um, or it, but for yeah. larger pieces, I would assume it would be actually a good idea to, to, to use like uh, these techniques as well. Um, yeah, so we are thinking about uh, using an ROV, uh, a, mm -hmm. a vehicle that will go along the ocean floor and take uh, images of where we are and uh, help us in the search. Uh, it's still uh, in preparation as to what we need. Obviously, it's also a matter of how much money we have and uh, who are the collaborators that will provide us the money and the, and the, mach and the tools that we need. So. I hope that within the coming months we'll have a much better idea uh, and then uh, hopefully if we speak again in a year I'll have more to report. But it has been the most exciting uh, uh, few weeks of my scientific career because I was trained as a theoretical physicist and it's all working in the realm of ideas and uh, maybe it's a sign of uh, maturing as I get older, but here I became an experimentalist, you know, collecting materials, studying them and trying to learn something about, about the first object that came from outside the solar system. So it's historic in any way, even if the source was natural. But the, the other thing I wanted to mention is usually to find what, what's outside the solar system, we use telescopes in astronomy. Here we use microscopes. <laughs> but also the good thing on the other hand is that Oumuamua went away so fast that practically people couldn't really observe. Yes, really. moreover. But this, we, yeah. this thing, whatever it is, will yes. stay here. <laughs> exactly. We have a museum, the ocean, and actually it's a very good museum because if this object was uh, exp uh, were to explode above the Sahara Desert, uh, all the uh, materials would be covered with sand after a decade. We wouldn't be able to find them. So uh, the fact that it exploded over the ocean was very fortunate. And of course, 71% of the Earth's uh, surface is ocean, so it was more likely to do that. Uh, but we are very lucky to be able to retrieve it. And also the cost is millions of dollars to, to do that. Whereas in space, you know, if you wanted to rendezvous with an interstellar object, it would cost billions of dollars, a factor of a thousand more. And uh, also a, an object like Oumuamua is very difficult to chase because it was moving very fast. So, so uh, you know, this one is much smaller. It's half a meter versus uh, 100, 200 meters for Oumuamua. There are many more of these small ones. Um, I calculated that within the orbit of the Earth around the Sun, there should be millions of them, mm -hmm. uh, so that one of them will collide with Earth uh, once per decade. So there should be many more, but we can't see them because they don't reflect enough sunlight for us to detect them. Just, just one last question. I remember that last year, uh, your colleague Amir Siraj and yourself published a, a paper on another interstellar meteor, That's right? That's Which is not the, the another one. I think it exploded in 2017 in the atmosphere. Yes, exactly right. In March 2017, uh, near between uh, Portugal and the Azores. And uh, we plan to visit it uh, later once we figure out what happened with this yeah. first interstellar meteor, IM1. So that will be indeed the work for the future. And, you know, it, it's good because um, in research, uh, you know, it's a never ending uh, process where you learn more as time goes on by uh, as long as you are seeking evidence. A lot of my colleagues have a very strong opinion, but 
uh, unfortunately, they don't seek the evidence uh, to substantiate that opinion. So when I, you know, I jog every morning on land uh, at sunrise, but I did that also on the ship. And um, one of the mornings, someone asked me, well, it looks like you are running, Avi. Are you running away from something or towards something? <laughs> and I said uh, both. I said, I'm running away from some of my colleagues who have very strong opinions without seeking the evidence. Uh, and I'm running towards a higher intelligence in interstellar space. All right. So good luck. Good luck to, to, for this purpose of, of really higher intelligence in the universe. And, Thank you. And, and please. I, and, and I discuss it in my book, The Implications for Humanity, the new book that just came out. So it, uh, Interstellar. Interstellar, right. yes. And you, you, you already told us that there may be, this may be just a second uh, volume of a trilogy. Oh, yeah. I'm actually okay. right now uh, contemplating the next book that will um, discuss the expeditions. Yes. Intergalactic, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> right? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we didn't reach that far, but um, the, the new item uh, that I will talk about in my next book would be using the ocean as a laboratory oh. for, for interstellar meteors. Yes. Yeah, this is fascinating. So thank you so much for keeping us informed. And of course, we will get back to you uh, probably next year. Now let's make it like a, a kind of a regular thing. Yes. And we, which we started. And, and it, I think it is very interesting for all of us. So thank you so much and good luck with your research. It's a great pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for coming. Nem volt elég a tudományból és a fantasztikumból? Olvasd a parallaxis.emtv.hu, lájkold a Facebook oldalunkat, nézd a YouTube csatornánkat, és hallgassd a Szokolébresztőt a Tilos Rádióban. Hamarosan jön a következő rész.